This is the Art of Network Engineering podcast. In this podcast, we'll explore tools, technologies, and talented people. We aim to bring you information that will expand your skill sets and toolbox and share the stories of fellow network engineers. Welcome to the Art of Network Engineering podcast. My name is Andy Laptev. Uh, You can find me at permitipandyandy.com, all my fun stuff. And tonight I am joined by Lexi Rocket Girl Cooper. How you doing, Lex? (laughs) Rocket Girl. I don't hate that nickname. I'm doing well, Andy. How are you doing? (laughs) I'm good. I want to point out that I'm I'm wearing a medal. I was going to ask you about that. My four-year-old daughter gave me a medal this morning and said, it's because I'm a great daddy and I haven't taken it off. I may never take it off. And, you know, I've reached, I've achieved all my goals. My daughter likes me. So like, what else is there, right? I'm so proud of you, Andy. Thank you. But I hear it all changes when they're teenagers. So we'll, we'll, we'll see if, we'll see how long this medal endures. (laughs) I mean, like maybe some teenagers are good. So for, for our fans, for our listeners, um, what's going on with the rocket ships? What can you tell us? Give us some proprietary every, secret info. Every time I talk to you, every time. <laughs> what's the network on the rocket? Somebody asked me straight up on Twitter today, like, hey, uh, I, I know you might not be able to talk about this, but like, what's the redundancy level on the rocket or something? And I was like, I can't tell you. <laughs> Is there anything asking? new you can tell us? Are you working on anything so vaguely like safe to tell us or I'll I'll tell you this I'll tell you this um I've been work so it's a lot of layer one work for me because you just have to consider layer one a lot when you're building something going up into space um for environmental reasons obviously and so everything has to be kind of like hardened both logically I guess and physically so I'm focusing a lot on layer one because I'm really weak on that and um part of that is I'm learning how to use things like like this week has been me focusing on oscilloscopes because I did not know how to use one, just learned it. Shout out to Andrew Zonenberg. Uh, he's a Zonenberg on Twitter. He walked me through an entire, like, I don't know, two hours of working with an oscilloscope. Um, I was just probing around trying to figure out like, is this guy, you know, what link pulses am I seeing? Cause I'm really interested in ethernet right now. And so, I've been going through this whole phase where I'm learning about auto negotiation and I was able this week with Andrew's help to uh, hook up the oscilloscope to a device that is using auto negotiation. I I saw the fast link pulses on there and it was just um, really, really, really cool because they, they, you can, you can definitely tell it's the specific, like they're a certain number of microseconds away from each other. And it's like, that is the fast link pulses. It's gigabit auto negotiation is very, very cool. Well, I remember from my CCNA days, somebody saying anything auto and networking, yeah, auto not do it. So I don't know if that's still. (laughs) Really? (laughs) Yeah. That sounds like the opposite Hard code everything. Yeah. No, bad. (laughs) Well, I mean, it depends on your situation. I won't say in every situation you should, but these days I think what we, we most of the time you want to use auto. I spent hours trying to turn stuff. off auto neg, auto neg, and I found out later you can't on like 100 gig SFP, whatever. Like it's it's not happening. Not not on consumer devices, Andy. <laughs> well, I'm gl- I haven't worked on a consumer device in a decade, but I'm glad that you're focusing on layer one. We all should focus on layer yeah. one. Uh, what do they say? 70% of network problems happen at layer one. So good stuff. I mean, it depends on what you're doing. Not everybody has to deep dive into layer one. I'm just doing it because I'm the crappy engineers don't. But yes, I I agree with everything you're saying. (laughs) (laughs) Only because I came from a physical place. I could talk to you all night. I'm fascinated with you and your job. uh, What's going on, Andy? Our our poor guest is just staring at us. I'm fine. I don't want to, I don't want to keep this man waiting any longer than he has to. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to say anything or just kind of say anything. We've, we've had feedback that like, Hey, you have your guests just staring there while you guys are bantering. But then we also have people like we love the banner. So you you can't keep people happy. I don't Uh, know. The voice you just, (laughs) The voice you just heard from the ether uh, is our guest tonight. His name is Jeffrey McLaughlin. How you doing, Jeffrey? I'm doing well. You can call me Jeff. That's fine. Jeff. Awesome. Jeff, you can call me Andy. All right. We're on good Um, terms already. (laughs) So uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, where do you work, what do you do? And, you know, maybe we'll travel back in time and figure out how you got there. 
Yeah, sure. I mean, first of all, I don't think I've ever used an oscilloscope uh, in my entire time as a network engineer. So that's pretty cool. Same. I actually, that, that, that's, uh, so the banter, I learned something, you know, I, I've never done that. I have used an oscilloscope, just not on a network or in my capacity as a network engineer. What so, have you used it on? I'm curious. Uh, little projects at, at home. I, I'm kind of into <laughs> retro computing and like getting old Apple twos to work again. And sometimes you need an oscilloscope for that kind of stuff. But um, anyways, I like it. So hold on. I, I didn't want to yeah. ask Lexi, Jeff, because you were just standing there staring at us very patiently. <laughs> what? So can you tell me quickly what an oscilloscope does? I have no idea. I know it's the wavy lines that I used to see in like Doctor Who episodes, but what, what would you mind, use an oscilloscope for? Keep in mind, I just learned what they are and how to use well, one. I asked Jeff, Actually, Lex. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. I just, what are the oscilloscope questions? <laughs> Who are you? You know, you did, and then I made the mistake of bringing up the oscilloscope. You stepped and now, right in there. We can we can pivot away and edit it out. <laughs> basically, it's plotting voltage over time, and yeah, it makes wavy uh, lines. So you know, you can okay. see, uh, you know, if if you were to hook a microphone up, you could see, you know, the pattern of your voice. If you hook it into a digital circuit, you'll see pulses. Um, huh. So that's it. Voltage over time. Okay. I mean, I used to use a volt meter in the field which is just voltage at that time, but it's voltage over time. Got it. Cool. Just a graph. Yeah. So who am I? Was that where we were? Who are you, man? (laughs) Who is this guy? Well, first of all, thank you for having me on. You know, I I think um, I I love what you guys are doing because you're evangelizing our industry and that's something we need and we could get into more about why I think we need we need that and we need more of it. Um, but I love, you know, I've been watching your, your videos for a while now. And so it's, it's great to be on here and to be with you. And, uh, like I was saying, I sent AJ, a, an email out of the blue and I figured he probably would go, eh, who are you? But he actually responded and here I am. So, uh, who am I? So right now I, well, my name's Jeff, as you said, Jeff McLaughlin, I work at Cisco. I know you work at Juniper. That's okay. We can still get hello. along. Hello, hello friend. We're and, all in networking. Uh, we're all, it's our network engineering, right? That's what it's yeah. about, you know? And yeah. Network engineering is bigger than any one company. Um, but I work, uh, so I'm a senior director of technical marketing at Cisco. Um, and that probably requires a certain amount of explanation for a lot of the, a lot of the listeners. But before I go there, I'm a career network engineer. So I've worked a number of different places for, for a long time now, probably longer than I want to think about. Um, <laughs> as far as the current job... Uh, the way I like to think about it is, you know, and you're familiar with this because you're in product management. Andy, Lexi may, may not uh, be quite as familiar with it if you haven't worked in, in one of the big tech companies. But you think about it, like how many like Cisco, we have different business units. So we have a business unit that makes collab stuff like WebEx, you know, and where I work is core networking, particularly enterprise networking. And that's routing, switching, wireless, and the software layers that, that manage all of that. And you've got a big team of engineers who build the products. And they're hardware engineers and software engineers. And they actually build the stuff. And then you have attached to that in the business unit a smaller group, which is product management and marketing. And what they do is they partner with engineering and advise engineering on what, what they should build, right? What products and features they should build. That's like the inbound function, right? Inbound of the company. And how do we know what to build? You know, through our expertise, through working with customers, salespeople, um, research, using our products in the lab, all of that factors into how we advise engineering on what they should be doing and what they should be prioritizing. Um, And then there's an outbound function, which is once they build stuff, actually educating our salespeople, our technical salespeople, our customers on how the stuff works. How do you deploy it? How do you you know, design, whatever, you know, technology, whatever kind of network, how does all of that work? So we have an education function as well. And, and I don't know if this is how it works at Juniper. I think it is, but, um, within Cisco, within product management, you have product managers who are usually more business focused. And I know Andy's pretty, pretty technical. So, uh, at Cisco, at least they're usually fairly focused on the, the business side of things. They're technical, but, they work on things like pricing and licensing and feature prioritization. And then the TMEs are the more technical side of um, product management. For example, at Cisco, we don't, uh, product managers don't have labs. I know you have a lab, Andy. I remember in one well, of the episodes you, you Thank you for saying I'm technical. That tickles my, that, that makes me happy because well, I, I struggle a lot of times with my level of technical proficiency when I speak to people like you and others in the industry. And I, it, it never feels good enough, right? I, I was doing a little bit of research on you and I see double CCI and I'm like, oh, great. You know, another 
genius network guy that's going to make me feel like an imposter. But um, but but yeah, I, I have a lab. I haven't been in product management that long, but I am learning a ton about the business side, which is fascinating. Yeah. But I love the technical, you know, and, and, and I, I don't want to give that up. And I noticed just in the few months I was away with my head in the business stuff, I went to do something in a lab and forgot everything. Like, it's just funny yeah. how fast it you know, the muscle memory. So, but yeah, I think it's similar to Cisco. Like you're saying, it's the product side's much more business oriented. Um, the TME folks are super technical. I thought I wanted to be a TME and that's what I was interviewing for before I found this product job. And then I met TMEs and I was like, Oh, <laughs> like these people go deep and they know a lot and like, they're super smart. Yeah. Yeah. That's been my experience. Right. Uh, you know, I don't know, a couple of things. I mean, first of all, I, I've been in management for a while, so my I do have a lab still, but my hands-on technical capabilities, you know, are, are diminishing as well. Uh, I, I try to stay technical, but it's hard, you know. And that, that's, you know, I know we have a lot of time. That's a good subject for a conversation, too. Uh, but I, I think it's really important that we have more people like you in product management who have a technical background. Uh, because the problem that we have as an industry... Uh, and again, this is a long, I'm opening a can of worms here and you may want to go more into my history or whatever, but the problem we have we is We have plenty industry. of time here. <laughs> we, we, we have all the time in the world. Or, you know, all right. <laughs> let's, yeah. I'll go on my rant then. You know, the, pro the problem we have as an industry is a lot of the people who are in charge um, are more business focused than technical, right? Yeah. So they, they, so in other words, the business people are usually in charge and it's not just within tech companies. I mean, if you look at CIOs, for example, CIOs are usually business people more than they're technologists. Um, and they're in charge and they see the technical people as sort of a service to them. Whereas I think the opposite is actually how it should work. The technical people should be in charge and the business people, you need them, right? You need people who know finance and all of that stuff, but they are really providing a service to the technical people. Right. And I write about this a bit on my blog. Like there's this problem in, in the corporate world in general. It's not just the tech industry. Right. It's pro probably in any any segment of the corporate world where you have people who just they know how to manage and they think that's enough and they don't understand the technology. You know, they're not like like us who have, who have built, you know, in my case, decades of hands on experience building networks. Right. And they come in and they've got their MBA or whatever, and they think they can you know, decide the direction of the strategy for products or even whole companies. Whereas I think, you know, you should you should understand the business right from from a hands on perspective before you start making those judgments. MBA is fine. Great. I'm not bashing MBAs. I'm just saying without context, it's worthless. And so, you know, it's great to have technical people like you in product management roles. Thank you. And yeah, and I and I have to give credit to the guy who brought me in, uh, Michael Bouchang, who, you know, I, I can't wait to have on here someday because he's just such a neat, he, he does a lot of different podcasts and, and stuff. And I just love, uh, he, he's mirroring what you're saying, right? Like he's been in the industry a long time and what the team that he's built, he brings in a mix of your traditional product managers that, you know, right out of school and, you know, Google, Facebook, you know, whatever, like, but it's, it's very business. They've never managed a network. Right. Yeah. But if you're in a company like yours or mine that makes networking products, it makes a hell of a lot more sense to your point to bring in people that are technical, that have experience hands on and like bring them into all these discussions and get their feedback. Like, Hey, you've been in network operations. Does this make sense to you? <laughs> you know, is because it actually I, that uncommon to not have technical people in these kinds of roles? Because I was assuming that was the common thing that happened. So right? There's a couple of interesting things. That's a good. That's a good question. So y if you look at product management roles, you'll often see you'll see a few different kinds of people. You will see people who have worked as network engineers and they've done a lot of jobs in the industry and they came in to become product manager. Um, You'll see people who got right out of grad school with an MBA and got hired in to a tech company. They don't have the history or the background and they could be put in charge of a product line in some cases or a part of a product line or a product or whatever, you know, and suddenly they're prioritizing the, the features that are getting developed and all of that. Uh, interestingly enough, you'll see this. I'm sure Andy could, could back me up here. Some people get these jobs who are technical but they came from engineering. So they're really like programmers or ASIC engineers or something like that. So they're technical, very technical. Huh. 
but they've never actually managed or operated a network, which is different, right, from programming. Why such a wide swath of different backgrounds? Well, it varies depending on uh, the hiring manager, you know, the business unit. Uh, so for, if you work in engineering, it's very commonly seen as a, as a, a career path, right? To advance, you want to go to, um, to the product management side, the business side, rather than stay in engineering, where it was one engineer said to me in engineering, I feel like a chicken on a chicken farm. <laughs> it's just it's like, <laughs> you know, you're just another chicken, right? So you become product manager and you've got business experience and then you can be maybe become a VP or something like that. Okay. So it's a um, certain stepping stone in a particular ladder. Exactly. Career path. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. So are these, um, and we're going to get back to you and your background, Jeff. I'm sorry, but this is so you interesting. Us, you brought us down here, Jeff. Here we are. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> but it's a great so conversation. It's my fault. Are, are no, companies no. hiring like... It's just interesting to me that you can have so many um, different, unique backgrounds. It almost sounds like the company or companies hiring for these roles don't really like there's is it like a sort of open ended like job rack or what, what does it look like when they're hiring both someone who's extremely technical and someone who just like has an MBA for the same role? Yeah, I, I mean, that's a fair question. It, there are a variety of product management roles, too. I mean, you know, you'll, you'll see that I think the typical candidate probably grew up in the business unit, probably came from engineering. Um, and then, okay. you know, we'll have, you know, like at Cisco, we've had a rotation program for new grad hires. So like they had a program specifically to hire people who just got their MBA um, and they come in and they rotate yeah. through different groups within the company. Okay. Um, which, which is great, you know, but I worked with one of those guys and he went out and he got a CCNA and he used to work booths with me at Cisco Live on like NetConf Yang program. But like he was hardcore, you know, he had his MBA, but he got into the technology uh, and that's what we need. You know, those kind of people. That's great. Um, some people I'm not passing judgment on anybody I may have worked with or I just you'll see some people who um, they're just kind of interested in business. But they don't have a passion for networking, you know, they just they're just interested in business. And so, you know, this is a good it's a big business. It's a good place to cut your teeth and, you know, get experience. And so they end up and, and companies you know. are in business, right? Like, yes, you could you could go to business school and get out and work at a vendor and know how to bring products to market with, you know, networking yeah. products without ever having worked on a network. So like valid questions, Lex, I've been pretty uh, surprised too. Um, you know, and, and it's. It's nice yeah, to, this, I mean, I, I, does I hope this line like, up my with pie, your experience, Andy, mine? like is, is well, this, sure. Yeah. I mean, so I, I don't know how typical I haven't been where I'm at long. I don't want to say anything to get myself sure. in trouble, um, sure. but <laughs> you know, um, what I've seen, it's a very varied skill set. There's people with networking. So even my team, um, I have a very bright, very experienced systems guy who's like real into like server and Linux and programming. The other guy on my team is a super cloud guy. You know, I'm like the NetOps guy. Our boss is this AI guy. So a, a lot. But if you look at what vendors are doing, Cisco, Juniper, there is this um, kind of coming together of different technologies. You're starting to hear about, you know, AI and, and predictive stuff and ML and, and automation. It's all programming. So I, I think we seem to be in a period in this industry where a lot of different technology, you know, it's not just route switch, right? I became a dinosaur sure. quickly. Like, what do you mean you don't know programming? Like, yeah. you know, a couple of years ago. So it's, but yeah, it's, it's, um, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by, by all of it. And I, I really want to get, I, I think I'd like to get back to your background because, um, you said something that, so does the TME educate customers? Are you in on strategy? Are, are you well, doing presentations in NFT? Like what, what's the, if you had, you know, what's your elevator pitch on TME? Like what's the job? What do I do? What does the TME do? Well, like I said, it's, I mean, a combination of, of guiding engineering as well as um, presenting. I mean, to answer your question, officially the field, the, the salespeople are, are real consumers, right? Like we need to get the salespeople to sell the product that our business unit makes. So we need to educate and they need experts, right? You're the technical experts yep. for the sales team, basically, right? And so in a simplified it, exactly. And, and think about, you know, especially if you've come up with a new product or a new feature and the field doesn't know it that well, um, they're going to come to us not just to learn it to so they can sell it, but they may have to go design a big, you know, deployment for a customer. And 
you know, our, our, you know, customer experience people may not be that familiar with it, et cetera. So TMEs get pulled on a lot to get into customer engagements. Like whether a POC, you might get pulled in like proof of concept kind of thing. and Proof of concept, yeah. even into the design, even sometimes the deployments, which is not really what I want. my Because, I, I, you know, I'm a senior director. I have a team of 40 TMEs under me now, a little bit more wow. than that, I think. Uh, you know, I... I I don't necessarily want them to be do deployment engineers, but sometimes you have to because you want to drive the sales of your product and nobody knows how to deploy it because it's new. Right. Um, but TMEs and you're the experts. Have, exactly. <laughs> right, like and, and, it's a blessing and a curse. I'm the smartest guy in the room. Crap, I got to go deploy. <laughs> exactly. And, and yeah. we get the stuff in our lab. We get the early engineering code. I mean, we're kicking the tires on these products very early giving feedback to engineering, working with the product managers when they say, I think we need this feature, then we will help them to fill out the technical details for engineering so they know, you know, what it is that they should be building. We work very closely with engineering, very closely with sales. So you're in the middle of a lot of different um, different groups within the company. Uh, I, I, of all the jobs, so I've done a lot of jobs. And I can talk about them, you know, because we have a lot of time. But to me, the, the TME job is probably the most it, it's the the most interesting role that I've done in this industry. You know, I'm glad you said that. Maybe so, so traditionally, and I don't want to say it's almost a tired format by now, but for the two years we've been doing this, who are you? What do you do? Let's go back in time and tell us every damn job you've ever had and every, you know, sandwich you <laughs> ate along the way. Right. But yeah. we've never had a TME on. Well, I'm happy to go back in your, you know, whatever you want to get into in your history, you know, like it, rock on. Like it's, it's, I think it's nice to have context on sure. where you came. Because for me, when I started this, I thought you had to be a computer science major and, you know, you get that job in IT and that wasn't how I got. And all, you know, the hundred, however many people we've spoken to, there's been so many different paths. So that's why I like the whole history thing, but I do you're too. also the first, you're, you're the first TME we've ever had on. So if we do go back in time, I leave it to you what you want to talk about, right? I know that's a pretty bad host thing to say, but what I really want to hear about is the TME role because we've never had one on. Why do you think it's so interesting and why it's so great? Because I didn't know what a TME was six months ago mm. and now I'm surrounded by them. And yeah. I'm, maybe I'm we, really you know, fascinated by the job. Maybe we can do both things and hear yeah. how you got, how you became a TME and then more about that. Yeah. I can I can go that route. Yeah, I mean I I, I can go, I mean I can go Paleolithic if you want to go. <laughs> <laughs> well, how'd you how'd you get yeah. into tech, right? Like I, I was a cable guy, right? That was my first job in tech. Like, were you a computer science major? Did you stumble no. upon it? Like, that's kind of an interesting thing because my path is actually very different from most TMEs and most uh, most network engineers. I think. Um, so okay, the, the Paleolithic part. Uh, yeah, so. For many people, this is shocking, but I grew up before the internet and before even, you know, computers were common in, in people's houses. And, you know, we got our first one, right? And it's like an Apple II with 48K. I'm sure you've heard this story before. Um, but the thing that was interesting, there, there was no internet to speak of back. I mean, it was there in some rudimentary form, but most people didn't have access to it. And, um, and so what we did was we had BBSs, bulletin board systems. And you got your, your computer, you got a modem, and you plugged in a phone line to that computer. And suddenly you could dial these other computers that were sitting out there and connect to them and look at what was on that thing. And, and it was like this whole new world. It was like being an explorer, like, like from your desk, you know, from your chair, right? And I was like, this is really cool. Like, like it, it, the computer itself back then was a novel enough concept. But like get, getting into other people's systems and you know, these are all text based, really slow loading kind of kind of systems. But you could go in there, post messages, exchange messages, download files. Um, you could even email people, although your email was specific to whatever bulletin board you dialed into because they were all inter independent and not connected. Right. What was your introduction? Was it through school? Was it just a hobbyist at home? You were curious. Like, how did you get? I think this. I read in magazines about modems back then. I'm like, I really okay. want one. I was like begging my dad, can we get a modem? Can we get a modem? And, you know, finally he relented. And then you go to the computer store, you buy the modem and they gave, they sold us a subscription to CompuServe at the time, which was like the precursor to the internet. Right. And you get in there, it's the same thing, message boards, emails, files, and it's, it just expands your horizons. And then I'm like, I want to operate one of these myself. So I set one up on my own mm. computer and you know I had about 300 users. I've actually done a couple posts on my blog, subnetzero.info for those who are, who are interested. 
where I actually, I, I recreated it. I, I used an emulator and fired up my old software and rebuilt my BBS. So there are screenshots and everything. So it, it but it was like, it, that's cool. It, it was such, it was so interesting to just, like I said, to explore and to see all these different, and people would customize their, their systems and you just see what people were doing and, is it BBS was, it was like a, a community? Board. Is that like a bulletin board kind of thing? Bulletin board. Yeah, that was why okay. they gave it that name. I mean, originally it was yeah, just yeah, a way yeah. to exchange messages. And then they started doing you know, files and like ASCII text-based games and things like that. Primitive. Very primitive. But that yeah, was but groundbreaking, right? Like, when, when, you know, what, what existed before? None of it. And now all of a sudden there's this whole world out there. Like, whoa. I'm it, talking it was, to other people out somewhere else. Like, what's happening? You know? Yeah, it was amazing. And... Um, and that was the start. I mean, that was networking for me back then. And um, but, you know, I, I went away as high school. I went away to college and um, I, I go to college. I, I went to a liberal arts college. It was not a good place to be a you know, computer science major. But I'm like, for various reasons, I, I, I messed up in applying to school. It was a good school, but just not for for tech people. But I'm like, OK, I'm going to take one class in computer science because you know, I actually wrote the code for my bulletin board. So I, I programmed it. I didn't write all the code. I mean, it came kind of prepackaged and I rewrote the whole thing. They gave you the source code. And so I get to college. I take my my computer science course uh, and we were using Pascal back then. That was the language that we programmed in. It was on data structures and algorithms and stuff. And I took the class and I hated it. And I, there's no way I'm I was, I was before that. I was like, maybe I'll transfer to a different school and do computer science. I took the class. I hated it. Um, and so I majored in political science, which is very unusual when you talk to other people who work at Cisco and the business unit. Most people majored in some computer science type field. Yeah. Interesting. All right. My manager was a poli sci <laughs> major and Good. he's a very interesting cat. I think it makes for very interesting conversations. He pulls us down on these rabbit holes of crazy, like <laughs> human stuff. And I swear it's because of his background and his education. Well, a liberal arts major, I think, is a good thing because it's not just like we have to communicate. We have to in my job, especially we have to write and speak, do public speaking. So being able to do those things, I mean, we'll get people who are great computer people, but, you know, they pretty much belong and want to be in a dark room somewhere and not. <laughs> you know, out in front of customers or whatever. So I think it's a good background. I, I don't think it should exclude people from our, our industry at all. Right. Yeah. Thanks but you for saying that it, as, what, what was, as an what English was major, major in English literature, See? I have not formally studied any technical. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good thing. Like don't so, think of that as a deficit. You actually have. A I, good I don't, background. but there are a shocking number of people who do. Yeah. Uh, I thought I, I was a, I had a bachelor of communications and and I thought it was useless. Oh, yeah. I mean it wasn't it, it, very liberal artsy very and now yeah. I I've been paid to communicate over the years and I'm told that being technical and able to communicate is a very valuable skill set but at the time going through that school I never thought it was something that was going to be valuable later. I thought damn I wish I was smart enough for computer science, you know, at the time. But yeah. it makes you very very well-rounded, you know, which helps when you're talking to people. I think it yeah, helps. I mean, just just yeah. the critical thinking skills alone, at least at least from you know what I studied, I think that applies to literally everything, and it definitely can apply to technical anything, right? English just critical majors thinking can alone. Build networks on rocket ships, obviously. <laughs> right? She's proven it. <laughs> yes, exactly. She can use an oscilloscope, and she's an English Look at major. Her. So. Just takes a couple hours and. Desperation, and you can get there just like me. A little help from your friends, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, what's interesting is like there, there's no real major in networking. I mean, some schools have, have have had that, and there is Cisco Networking Academy, but usually you do a computer science degree. You're studying programming. Yeah. Um, I do have a master's in telecommunications management, which is not quite networking, but kind of. But that's rare, and actually, that school doesn't even have that degree anymore. Um, so you know. At that point, if you major in computer science, you're not really studying networking, except in rare, rare cases where they may have a specialty in that at a particular school. So you might as well major in English and then get certifications, which is what really matters, and then get experience. Right. You know, it frustrates yeah. me when I'm speaking to people about networking 
And yes, they're programmers, right? Like they're telling me how the network should be and they've never managed the network. <laughs> and you know, uh, uh, yeah, but, yeah, but you know, uh, but here we are right now, we're automating and it's programmatic and we're, you know, DevOps and all this stuff. But I have a really, and again, this isn't really happening at my job, but throughout my career, I've just felt, you know, when somebody's telling me about networking and they've never managed a network, I just, something happens inside of me where I just want to jump across the table and tell them like, you have no context. You don't know what you're talking about. Like go That's, write some code. What are you talking about? I and I know you. that's ignorant to say, but you know, well, uh, you know, I talk about this, I'm doing Cisco <laughs> live next week and I talk about this. I do a session called the CCIE in an SDN world hmm. uh, because, you know, and I start out by quoting, you know, all these people saying the CCIE is not relevant. You know, you need to learn to code oh. and you need to learn Python. And I know you don't like that, Andy, because I've seen the episodes <laughs> of this, but you know, my point is, okay, learn to code. That's fine. Um, you don't need to be, but, but if you're planning to automate networks, you better damn well know how they work. Because if you just learn Python and you try to automate a network, you don't, you don't know what OSPF is. You don't know what BGP is. How are you going to configure them with a Python script? So it's just a tool. It's just another way to, it's a tool that you can use as a network engineer. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I mean, is computer science a good background or major to become a network engineer? I mean, sure. It's good. It's, it's not sufficient. It teaches you logic and how computers work and all that, which is a good background, right? But it's not sufficient and it's not necessary either. It's okay. It's good. But you think like they should teach more supplement. networking in computer science? Or do you think that it makes sense that computer science is programming? I've never <laughs> I've never passed computer science classes, so I don't have the <laughs> the context to have an opinion that makes any sense. I think it's fine now. I mean, you could, yeah. I suppose, come up with a college program in it, but you, you know, you know how we all do it is we, we, we train ourselves and we train right. on the job and a lot of people train in certification programs and you yeah. know, that's how we learn our, our trade. It never ends. So you're in a liberal arts college. How do you, how do you get from uh, studying <laughs> Shakespeare to <laughs> political science networks? And I was, I was political theory, which is like Plato and Aristotle and all this. Uh, so, so I get out and, and, and I've, got, I, I've got my degree in, in political philosophy. And I'm like, OK, now what do I do? <laughs> uh, like what they, there's I couldn't find jobs for political philosophers to save my life. And I didn't want to get a Ph.D. <laughs> And, you know, back then there was no LinkedIn. Uh, there was no, there wasn't even Dice.com. There was, I think Mon Monster may have existed in 1995 when I got out. But I end up getting a job at a company, a small company that designs and builds museum exhibits. So, now that's an unusual path, right? Mo I've never yeah. met anyone else. I, that you may meet so another cool. poli sci major. You won't meet someone who worked at a company that, that designs and builds museum exhibits. <laughs> so, so you think about it, you go to a museum, they have, you know, I don't know, an exhibit on alligators or something. Like somebody actually has to design that and they have to figure out, you know, there's going to be a stuffed alligator here or, or a, you know, a animated, out, whatever it is, you know, a, a mural of their habitat, all these different things. Somebody has to design that and somebody has to build it. Most companies do one or the other. I actually worked at a company that did both. So you hire us, we've got the designers, the architects, the researchers, they'll design your exhibit. And then downstairs are all the people who actually will fabricate it for you. Huh. Now I know you're still thinking like, how does that get to network engineering? Yeah, what did you, what, <laughs> what did you do there? What was your role? Were Good you question. They hired me to do stuff? odd jobs. Hmm. So I, my first day I showed up, I was dressed in nice office clothes and they put me in a paper suit and had me wash paint buckets for the muralists. Uh, nice. The next day I was in a hot room basically making copies. In fact, I did that for like a week, just make copies. Um, so it was and then eventually I became a gopher. I don't know if you know what a gopher is. Gophers go for stuff. So yeah. like the, the, the design, the, the fabricators would need, you know, some nails or a screw gun or whatever. Um, stuffed alligator. I don't know. And they would send me out to go pick this thing up in a truck. And so I drive. How long around until you stop wearing your nice clothes? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty quickly. Good yeah. question. <laughs> um, but you know the thing was so so the the, the person it was thirty people actually it was sixty people in the company like 35, 30 maybe actual computers there because most of them were in the shop they didn't have a computer. 
And the VP of operations, she comes to me and says, you're good with computers, right? And I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty good. And the problem she had, the manager of the design studio was doing all the computer stuff. So he was the, like the sysadmin for the company. And she wanted him to actually be doing design. And she said, so can you take over and manage the computers, which was basically installing software, upgrading them, swapping out systems. We had a lot of turnover there. So there's a lot of backing people's stuff up and getting a computer ready for the new person coming in. Um, and it was a network of mostly Macs. This was in the 90s, which is like the beige box era of Macs. So it was before Steve Jobs came back and they became cool again. Um, and so I became the sysadmin. Well, at the same time, having to wash paint buckets, make copies and go for things, right? Uh, it was like a mix of, of, the, of the two, which was one of the reasons I quit after about a year. But I got my hands dirty and, and that was also the first network I managed because their 35 Macs were networked. Do huh. you want to know how? <laughs> yes. Very much. Was it, co yeah. was it coax? It was not coax. Uh, it was my favorite network networking technology of all times, which was phone net. Okay. Huh. Most, if you worked on Macs from that era, you would know what phone net is. So the Mac back then, I mean, not a lot of computers actually had built-in networking. The Mac did. Something they got right. It had its own protocol suite, hmm. Apple Talk. Interesting. Which was equivalent to TCP IP, right. um, but it was Apple Talk. It did all the same things as TCP IP. Um, and in fact, it did really good auto configuration. I mean, you plug in your Mac, you didn't need a DHCP server. It would just broadcast, it would pick a random address and go, can I use this? And if no other station said, I'm using it, it would use that address, right? So it, it was designed that you could just turn it up with very little experience. Um, and PhoneNet, so, so they made it, there's a serial port on the back of each Mac and you could daisy chain them with this thick serial cable. And this company called Farallon came up with a dongle that plugged in there called the PhoneNet connector. And what it did was it created an RJ11 phone jack for your network and it used one single twisted pair of wires. So what did you have back then? You didn't have any wireless. So most desks had a phone and it was either one or in the case of that company, two pairs in the in a category three cable is what we had before cat five. And so, you know, two pairs are being used for the phone. And then the third pair you'd use for your network. And the way it tied together, you could do different topologies and mix and match them. So one the most basic topology is a passive star. Well, actually, the most basic topology was just daisy chain. You could daisy chain the phone net, just run a little phone cord between all the different computers. But then passive star, you'd run them all in a star format to a central location and then physically tie the wires together. <laughs> and that was enough to get it to work. That's awesome. Wait, wait, wait. What do you mean <laughs> physically tie the well, wires? You, you could yeah. either strip the wires and just sit there. And, and But if you had too many of them, you know, what you do is you'd run a jumper on a punch down block just from one to the other to the other, which is what we did. But the funny thing was there was a limitation of four branches on a passive star. And we actually had 30 and things started to fall apart. And I'm like, why? And I looked up the specs and I'm like, oh, we've got 30 and we're supposed to only have four. But they also had a, a, a hub called a star controller that you could put in the middle of this thing. Um, and so you could mix them. So you could have a star controller and one, instead of going straight to a station, you could have one wire that went to a passive star with four forks. And then off of one of those passive stars, you could have a daisy chain. So it was really flexible. It was amazing, oh. actually. Very advanced, but it was slow. That was the problem. So yeah. How did you learn huh. about all this? You were just trying things out and reading specs and just doing what worked at the time? Pretty much. I mean, Google wasn't around. Uh, I don't even think Alta Vista was around, you, you know, so the information on the internet was limited. A lot of it was trial and error. You know, I, I just, so, so the funny thing was, here's another funny story. I, I, I may, I may spend too much time in the 1990s, but why not? So <laughs> I, I was really fascinated by the phone system too and how it all worked. And so I, I started, I, I found the punch down blocks and I'm trying to figure out like, there were 66 blocks, which have like bare metal, right? And I'm trying to figure out like, how does this work? Well, I couldn't Google it because there's no Google. And so I figured out, it seems like the wires kind of slide into the connector and then they're, they're cut somehow. So I got a couple of pliers and just like started sliding wires in. It, it worked, right? I moved phones around, I'd slide and there'd be all these sparks flying. And I'm like, yeah, it seems to work. So then one day I did it and all the phones in the building went out. This is before cell phones, right? So business was over. <laughs> I'm like, oh man, but 
you know, then I then the phone phone people came out and replaced the um, the system we had, and she actually showed me what a punch down tool was. And I'm like, I was going to say you needed your punch down, man. <laughs> I'm going to go buy one of those for the next time. But you know, it was trial and error and experimentation like that. Some of it you could find in you know in magazines and books. There were books that I bought. You know, there were several books on networking even back then. Um, some of it was vendor specs. Some of it was just yeah trial and error. I love learning that way. Yeah. Like, yeah. You know, you're just, you're in there and you're figuring it out and you're breaking stuff. And, you know, I guess this, as long as the stakes aren't too high and you're not like, you know, burning down a data center or like in the middle of the day or something. I mean, I'm sure the people weren't happy when you fried their phone system, but I, I love to learn by doing. Yeah. yeah they stories, happy. stories like that make me wish that I were a sentient being back in, you know, when the internet was so. <laughs> No offense intended. I'm sorry. I don't know how to say that without sounding kind of like a jerk, but like, no, no, I, I was wish, sentient most you know. of the time back then. Not all the time. <laughs> it was the nineties. We weren't all that sentient. <laughs> yeah. I can't, I can't call myself sentient in the nineties. I um, wish I was a sentient being in the nineties. That's the sweetest was, way existed, someone's called me old Jeff. But <laughs> <laughs> well, well, but, but, uh, you know, to, to your point, there is a way. Um, even now, like tying it back to technical marketing, for example, I mean, we get the latest code from engineering in the lab and we got to figure it out and make it work. And it usually doesn't the first time around. And <laughs> yeah, we can't Google it. We can't, you, you know, you've got to work with engineering. You've got to call the right people. You've got to do trial and error. Um, so that's a great get thing. Lab, One of the right? things I love about, about this get job. In the lab. Get, get in the get, lab, get your hands dirty. Yeah. Figure it yeah. out. So that's yeah. a great, that's a great first job right i mean you didn't know when you were cleaning out buckets and stuff you'd be running their their computer network someday but that's that's a really cool way to come up i think in the in tech right it, it was a lot of luck too i mean it just so happened that they had that that vacancy otherwise maybe i'd still be washing buckets <laughs> i don't know <laughs> there's there's so much luck i hate to call it luck right yeah. you have all those cliches of like luck favors the prepared or whatever but there's there's no way i could have planned out my career as, as well as it's gone. There really seems to be something else going on, call it luck or whatever. I mean, you have to be there, right? And you have to be yeah. <laughs> putting yourself out there. But so you stayed there about a year, I guess that, but that was your first foray. You learned some phone systems, you learned some networking. That was the first foray. Yeah. And then I, I actually had a friend who worked at a consulting company. I'm from San Francisco, by the way, this is all taking place in the San Francisco mm. Bay area. Uh, so I had a friend who worked at a consulting company that mostly dealt with advertising agencies and they were Mac shops. I was a Mac guy at that point. And, um, you know, in the nineties, that was in the dot com boom. And so the dot coms, basically the, the v VCs were funneling money into dot coms, dot coms were funneling money into advertising. So the advertising industry in San Francisco just went crazy. Yeah. And then they were hiring it guys to help them build out their, you know, move to new buildings and become, you know, bigger ad agencies and all that until it all fell over in like 2000. So you were an employee at an ad agency? I worked, I was a contractor for this consulting oh, okay. company, working at multiple ad agencies um, and doing the same kind of stuff. I mean, installing software, uh, you know, doing basic networking back then, basic, um, but doing networking. And, you know, I, I'd been out at dinner with my, my friend and, and another guy who worked there and I was still working at the, the bucket washing place. And then they were talking about ISDN and like, oh, yeah, we're getting an ISDN line install here and we're getting a T1 at this place. And I'm thinking this is so cool because I didn't even have Internet connectivity at that place I worked. We didn't have anything. Actually, we put a modem on a computer eventually and that was our Internet, you know. Uh, so I'm listening to these guys. I'm like, man, I want to work there. Like, I want to work on ISDN. I want to work on T. I don't even know what they are, but they sound cool. <laughs> like, I didn't know the phone company could deliver something other than a phone line. And uh, and so I went to work there and it was a bit more of the same. But I was just working with more companies. I wasn't doing the bucket washing thing or answering phones anymore. I was doing, you know, pure IT guy. But I was paid pretty, pretty badly, I have to say. Hmm. I mean, it wasn't worth that much. I only had a year of experience, so it, I wasn't paid unfairly, but it was, I was paid badly. And to live in San Francisco, even then on that salary, I only lasted there for a couple of years. So how, how do you find the money to like, <laughs> it was, you know, San Francisco is not a cheap place to live, is it? No, it is not now for sure. I mean, it wasn't yeah. back then. Uh, you know, 
I'm sitting there, I'm talking to my friend and I really want to be a network guy. Like that was the thing that I loved, you know, it fascinated me. Like installing Microsoft Word on someone's computer, you know, fixing their email, eh, not so interesting. Even server admin stuff, I, I liked it better, but that wasn't where my passion was. But when they gave me the keys to the wiring closet and I go in there and it's dark and all the lights are blinking. I know AJ is not here. No blinky blinky. But I, I was like, <laughs> yes, blinky blinky. <laughs> I loved it. And I'm like, this stuff is cool. You know, all these wires, where do they go? I want to learn this. I want to do this. Mm-hmm. And I was talking to my friend uh, and he said, you know, most people who do that kind of stuff have some kind of credential. Uh, I'm thinking, OK, I need to get a credential. What do I do? And I didn't know really anything about certifications at the time. But I started looking around all the universities in the area and one a local university, Golden Gate University in downtown San Francisco, had a program, like I said, on telecommunications management. And I'm like, that's kind of like networking. So I met with the chair of the department and she said, we're re- revamping the program is really oriented around phone people. So people who worked at Pacific Bell, which was the old phone company in the Bay Area before it got acquired multiple times. Uh, but we're reoriented, reorienting the program. This is 1998 around data networking, or at least there'll be a specialty in data networking. I'm like, cool. That's what I want to do. So I quit that job. <clears throat> I went into this master's program and I. Um, I, I kept, I actually peeled off and stole one of the clients from my, my old company just so I had a paycheck and I would work with them part time. And I did my master's in telecom management, um, and, and which was OK. But to, to be honest, it, the professors were, were a mix. Some were just terrible. Uh, we, we had one guy who taught a class on networking protocols and he'd come in with a for dummies book and he's like, OK, I just read TCP IP for dummies last night and this is what DHCP is. And it seems like, Poor guy. Oh my God. <laughs> We're paying uh, you for this? <laughs> yeah, right? Uh, because wow. it's the 90s, like late 90s, you couldn't hire network people. I mean, they were having a hard time, I think, filling their adjunct slots. And uh, he had a good okay. resume, but then we actually talked to the guys. Like, okay. Uh, I had a few. I had one class on networking security that was awesome, like life changingly good. Um, but, you know, I, I get out and I've got this master's and I'm like, cool. I've got a master of science degree. I'm going to be such a hot commodity. I'm going to get, <laughs> I'm going to get hired into the best network job ever. And so I go on, we had dice.com at that point. So I go on dice. I update my, I post my resume with my masters. You know, I've done research. Yes, I've done research and nothing. Like I'm getting nothing. <laughs> Nobody's calling me. Huh. And I'm like, man, what did I do? And finally I get a call from this company And I go to an interview and basically it's the same thing I was doing before at the consulting company, just installing software, fixing people's PCs, you know, and they offered me double what my salary was at the previous place. So I'm sitting there like, wow, double, you know, maybe I should take this job, you know, like double my, I mean, I've doubled it, but it's not what I I don't want to, I I did the degree to get away from this. Right. Hmm. And so I'm sitting there thinking, what, what can I do? And I remembered something someone had told me a while back, which was get a Cisco certification. They're gold. They're gold. That was, those were his words. So I pull out a global knowledge catalog that I got in the mail and they had like the next week in San Mateo, just South of San Francisco, they had a boot camp for the CCNA. And it was one test back then. I, I, I don't know how it is now, but uh, it used to be. I know it was more than one test at one point. So I go, it's four days of a class. And then on the fifth day, you go and take the exam there. Like actually, <laughs> same place where you wow. took the class, which seemed a little weird. Wow. But anyways, sounds um, intense. <laughs> so I went in and four days, I never touched a Cisco router. You know, I'd only done basic networking. Uh, great class. The, the instructor was awesome. Tony Marshall. If you're out there, Tony, I never found him again. Tony, you were, <laughs> you were awesome. And I devoured the material. Like I, I was so into it. I, every night I'd come home and I'd study and I'd come in early, early to lab, you know, lab it all up. Cause my lab partner was, was just, was not following the stuff. So he was slowing me down. So I'd come in early to s- set it all up. Fifth Did you say day, this was Netacad? Was it Netacad or was this pre Netacad? Pre Netacad. Oh, I don't think they had it then. It was yeah, not Netacad. Okay. It was a four day yeah. boot camp from Global Knowledge. Yeah. Right. Gotcha. Fifth day, I took the test, passed with, they, it was on a uh, scale of 1,000 then, and I passed with 947 out of 1,000. Oh my God. Yeah. First time? First time. <sighs> Please tell me the test was easy. 
I it spent hard. two years yeah, of my life trying it. to pass that damn exam. Really? What, wait, what year was this? What year was this that you took it? 2000. Okay. It had IPX super... back then. It had um, frame relay, I think. Did you find it to be difficult? Was it a difficult exam? Was it multiple choice? Did they have sims? Were there scenarios? All multiple choice. Do you remember? All okay. multiple choice. Uh, I thought the class was adequate preparation. It was an intense class, though. I mean, I studied yeah. very hard in that class. Not everybody passed it, but I, I was so right. into it. To me, it was like, if you have a passion for it, and yeah. I was just like, I'm going to pass this. And I did. And so I got my CCNA. Out. I remember she pulled it out of the printer and like ripped the paper. I'm like, darn it. <laughs> but I still have it. And... Um, <laughs> So I go, I go back on Dice, and I update my resume, and I put Cisco Certified Network Associate. Here it my comes. My phone starts ringing off the hook. <laughs> <laughs> my phone's phone. been ringing ever since I got that cert, Jeff. <laughs> it's still <laughs> ringing. <laughs> still, I, know, I still get, get calls even now, where the, or LinkedIn <laughs> invites, where it's, it's like, we need you to be like an entry-level you know, conf- network. And I'm like, have you read my LinkedIn? Uh-oh. <laughs> The first time in my life people called me for jobs was after I got my CCNA and it just hasn't stopped 10 years later. It's crazy. Same. So, Same. so wow, that's so you where did you land? Your phone starts blowing up. Well, I have to say I was like, first of all, like, why did I just spend two years in my master's program? You know, <laughs> yeah, um, I didn't know at the time, you know, recruiters did keyword searches and all I probably mm-hmm. if I probably put the master's and just put Cisco anywhere on there. I probably would have had the same effect. But yeah, um, I got a call from. A recruiter for uh, a company called the San Francisco Newspaper Agency. A, a, a quick lesson, history lesson here. So back back when people actually read the newspaper before you know the internet was so prominent, and a lot of a lot of cities had were there were two newspaper towns, right? There's a morning and an evening newspaper, and a lot of those newspapers would go out of business, and the judges would say, "Well, that's an antitrust violation. It's going to be a not monopoly." So they forced the newspapers the two competing newspapers into a joint operating agreement where they would have separate content, but they would share the same printing distribution, like the business side of things would be done by a third party company that they jointly owned. So it's kind of like if you had Coke and Pepsi where they developed their own formulas, but you had the same bottling plants, the same trucks, the same advert, all that was handled by the same, but you know, you you just had separate formulas. That was it. And so what happened was when I when I was hired, I was hired by that third party company that did the printing and distribution. But it was right after the Hearst Corporation, which owned the San Francisco Examiner, had bought the San Francisco Chronicle. And so now they owned all three and they were just folding the whole thing into the Chronicle. And, you know, judges by that point had moved beyond the antitrust thing. So basically, I worked for for about five years for the San Francisco Chronicle, the newspaper running their network. Running the network. I was, I was a pure network guy. I was, when I interviewed, my boss said, our responsibility stops at the jack. We are network guys. That's it. And I'm like, that's what I want. Cool. Yeah. Give me a D mark. Not my problem, our, bro. Yeah. Our responsibility <laughs> ends here. Love it. Yeah. That was before wireless, obviously. Hey, everyone. It's Lexi, a.k.a. Track It Pacer, or as my coworkers now know me, that little gremlin that keeps crawling in and out of the server racks. I have a question for you. Have you ever heard of the USNUA? So let me throw three topics at you. Number one, network engineering. Number two, no annoying sales pitches. And number three, beer. Does it get any better? Have you ever wished you could have someone to chat with in person about network design that isn't trying to sell something to you? If your answer is yes, then let me tell you, you need to check out the USNUA. The US Networking User Association is a group of fellow network engineers that like to openly chat about all things networking. And the added bonus, there's no selling. These user group meetings are completely devoid of OEM agendas. That means no pushy salespeople cornering you after the meeting, trying to squeeze you for that next purchase order while you're just there to get mildly buzzed and talk about VXLAN or something. Find out all the goodness of the USNUA, that's the US Networking User Association, by going to usnua.com. We hope to see you at the next meetup in your area. So that was huge, huh? You got your CCNA that changed everything. You got this awesome network job. You probably learned a ton. You were there about five years, you said? Yeah, a little under five years, I think. Yeah, Yeah, it was a great learning experience. Yeah. 
I feel like that first five years of experience is important. I had a guy I used yeah. to work with Joe and he always said, you know, the reason every job posting out there says like five plus years experience is because there's, there's poor people in the first five years of career. You know, you're not sure what you're doing. You're breaking stuff. You're like, I think this is it. Full send. And, you know, companies just don't. They, they want somebody who's gone through all that pain already. So, like, yeah, once you're five years in, you were probably pretty, pretty proficient at that point, right? Yeah. Confident, you know, know what you're doing. It's interesting. I was the lead network engineer pretty much right off the bat for a major mm -hmm. metropolitan newspaper back when newspapers were, were widely read, like I said. And so pretty quickly I had to come up to speed because if I didn't do my job right, there was not going to be a newspaper delivered to people's doors the next morning. <laughs> Wow. Um, and, and so it was a high stress environment. It wasn't that complex of a network. I mean, it's complex in that you had IPX and Apple Talk and you had uh, a mainframe. So you had SNA. So there's some weird things like that. But, um, but they're high stakes, right? That paper doesn't stakes. get out if the network goes down. That's yeah, that's a big deal. Have, yeah. you, have you had like uh, do you have any like outage stories, any nightmares of like we were up all night fixing an outage so oh, the yeah. paper could get out? <laughs> <laughs> my, my favorite one was, was the way they sent the pages to the printing plant. So we had our downtown San Francisco office, but we had three printing plants around the Bay Area. We actually had a microwave dish on top of our clock tower on our building, and uh -huh. they used microwave to send it to a repeater up and on a mountain. And that repeater bounced the signal down to the three different printing plants. And that showed up for us network guys as a T1. So the, 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 it was just handed off to a T1. We plugged in. It looked like a regular T1 to us. Hmm. But one day, all of the T1s go down. And we switch over to the backups. Obviously, we had backups, right? And we're like, what's going on? And the guy who ran the microwave was like, yeah, it's not the microwave. It's your routers. Your routers aren't working. <laughs> we're arguing about it. Finally, we all went and climbed to the top of the clock tower. And we looked and we saw that the Moscone Center, the San Francisco Convention Center, they were building a, a second, an expansion to it, basically. And they had built the cooling tower right into the path of the microwave. Line of sight, right? <laughs> Line of For sight. The microwave. Oh, that's funny. And it took <laughs> out the microwave. Ah. And so, you know, we were on our backup lines, but man, you know, being on your backups, like you need more than one level of backup for, for a mm. newspaper, right? To be sure the pages get to the plants. Yeah. yeah. So we ended up, uh, we ended up doing, uh, you know, running on backup T1s for a while, but we had, we had to get welders to come out to cut the, the frame of the microwave dish and like lift it up and reorient it and bounce it off another <laughs> building. Higher. I think it took yeah. a couple of years to get all the permits and stuff. So. Oh my God. Yeah. You're up there standing on the tower, holding it above the <laughs> damn other thing just to get the pages over. Wow. Well, I said if anybody brought a micro, uh, brought a popcorn bag into that cooling tower, they, they could have made popcorn probably with our microwave. <laughs> hitting oh it. my God. But, yeah. It was, it was fun. Times. It was an enjoyable job for sure. For sure. Yeah, so I really want to get I really want to get back to TME and, and, and figure out how awesome it is. So h how do we jump? W was Cisco always on your radar? I know that you've been at Cisco for a while. Was that like a dream job for you? Was that on your you know, was that a happy accident or did you get there on purpose? I'll, I'll make the rest of the journey shorter because uh, okay. I can diverge into a lot of stories. But yeah, I mean, so I ended up working for Cisco after I got my CCIE while well, I worked at the Chronicle. Oh, um, we can't skip the CCIE. The okay. double CCIE show yeah, off. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, well, you can read my blog. I wrote a whole series of articles called 10 Years of CCIE. I went through the whole, the whole, the whole experience. But, um, uh, is that your blog years? again? What's your blog? <laughs> it didn't take me 10 called? years to get it. it was that, I wrote that <laughs> 10 years after I got it. So. Uh, yeah, give us the blog. What, what is it again? Oh, subnet0, all one word, dot info. Subnet0, dot info. All right. We'll put that in the notes for sure. Um, yeah, I was working at the Chronicle and I wanted to get out at a certain point and I knew the CCIE, like I wanted to be a CCIE hall, you know, I thought they were like geniuses and they were so smart and like, that's what I wanted. You just want to be the best sometimes. And I wanted to be the best. Yeah. So I went and, um, bought a bunch of material. I built a lab in my apartment cause you know, I didn't work at Cisco. I didn't work at a big nice. company. So I, I was buying you know, router, this is before GNS three and that kind of stuff. So I was, I was buying routers off eBay. Uh, 2,500 series routers, you know, taking decommissioned ones from work and I built a lab and, um, I took the test in 2004 and I passed on my first attempt. Oh my God. Yeah. I'm so happy for you, Jeff. I, I, I didn't pass. <laughs> Are you one of those guys who's never failed a Cisco exam? And no. he's like, 
I'm so happy and just uh, maybe a little bit jealous. You know. <laughs> Some of it's luck because there are a couple subjects that I was quite bad at that just didn't show up on that particular exam I saw that day. And if yeah. I took the other exam that they might have been giving, yeah, I might have failed. And was that the two-day exam when you took it? I'm a one-day guy. It yeah, was cool. one day. Good. Yeah, cool. Okay. Yeah, the but two was that day, the lab where you go in? Hard. Yeah, I, I, I remember hearing before it was like a physical lab you'd go in and work on and then you'd leave and then they'd break it on you and then you'd have to go back in and yeah. were, were you under that? The no, they, they changed that. That was, I mean, okay. that was what it was known for. And when they changed yeah. it to a one day lab, a lot of us were like, is this even worth doing anymore? Cause everybody, mm -hmm. when they talked about it, they're like, it's two days. They're going to break it. It's so hard. Yeah. And then you hear, Oh, we're going to one day and we're getting rid of the troubleshooting. It was like, should I do it? And the answer was there was no, there's no other game in town. So yeah, right. we, we did it and making it one day made sense. Cause it used to take like six months to schedule your lab. So mm -hmm. they could schedule them a lot more, you know, Frequently now. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Wow. So that was so your... You R, was that route and switch then? Route switch. Yeah. Okay. Because I noticed you have another one. <laughs> the security, yeah. right? So I, I got I got hired by Cisco after that. Basically, I was posting... There's a mailing list back then that p the people who want to study for the CCIA subscribe to. And I got contacted by a manager at Cisco uh, and ended up getting hired in the TAC, high touch technical support, which is like Cisco's biggest okay. customers. And for a couple of years, I worked on routing protocols, service provider routing protocols in TAC. Wow. And I know you've talked about the TAC experience with many people here and I second pretty much everything. Thank God said. for TAC. <laughs> I've, I've, I've worked with the HTAC oh, yeah. folks working at a service provider and oh my God, they've saved my bacon so many times. I, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed at the people in TAC. I got, I, I had the pleasure of meeting a few of them at, at a meetup we had recently in Asheville and just like, wow, I, I could talk to those people forever. I mean, just oh, what yeah. they know, right? Like what you knew, yeah. what was in your head, all the cases, like I, I, the stress of it. I'm just amazed at that job. There needs to be like a... Cisco Tech podcast, like just the stories of Tech. Well, I do, I, I do have on my blog like pl plug for my blog again. Sorry, Lexi, but uh, I do have uh, I think twenty Tech Tales on my blog. They're wow, they're entertaining. Wait, I did think. you call them Tech Tales? Tech oh, Tales, yeah. <laughs> Tech Tales. There's the podcast right there. I should just turn yeah. it into a podcast. Absolutely, I'd yeah. listen. But, you know, every uh, Tech person I think we talk to is like, I should start a podcast about Tech stories. Someone's got to do it. It was a, it was a really challenging place to work, and like I said, your your previous guests have covered it pretty well. Um, it, 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 even having worked for five years as a network engineer at that point, like getting thrown into large scale service provider outages. I mean, my my, uh, I know you want to get to TME. A couple stories, quick ones. One, you know, like my, they told me it'd be three months before I would take a case um, because I, I needed that much time to ramp up. So about a week into my job, they're like, there's nobody on the queue. There's a P1 coming in. We need you to take it. <laughs> so I pick up the phone and it was a multicast outage, which uh. is like the worst thing, right? And I'm just freaking out. I'm like, oh my, what am I going to do? And I, I just, okay, just talk to them. Get a di Start <laughs> building a diagram of the network on your piece of paper. Figure it out. Multicast too, huh? Yeah. Mm. And luckily my mm. mentor, like, I paged him and he came back in like 15 minutes and <laughs> took over. But it, it, it was, and then there, there was another time similar when I got in a service provider, I had never heard of a GSR, Gigabit Switch Router, which was the big service provider platform Cisco made at the time. And they moved, just moved me in a service provider from enterprise. And again, a P1 comes in on GSR. I didn't even know if it ran iOS and it was a major one. I like put the phone on hold. And I start running around the third floor building K going, does anyone know GSR? Does anyone know? <laughs> and my, my friend Abe, who I didn't know at the time, was like getting his coffee. And he's like, why, yes. <laughs> I was a product <laughs> manager on GSR once upon a time. I'm like, help me. I took a P1. I took a P1. I don't know what to do. And he goes, way to grab the bull by the horns. And then we like charged in and took the case. But yeah, that was tack. That's awesome. Crazy place. Crazy place. What good, a great good way year. to learn, Good experience. Though. Yeah. Trial by fire. And, and I've heard right. from every tech person I've spoken to. I, I know the culture might change over the years, but everybody there is like super helpful. Like you just yeah. yelling like for help and people come and running. I've heard that a lot. And that's <laughs> that's always great to hear. You, you need for that in that part. kind of environment. You'll drown. Yeah, I don't know how All you right. could function without that. Right. Like, 
I've been Everybody in places where people other. run and hide. Like when I was at a knock and an ISP, <laughs> the board uh, lights up, 300 things break, and people disappear. Like, oh, my mom's calling me. <laughs> like, run out the yeah. room. You know, like, yo, this is what I need you. You know, you well, find out learned, what people are made of when it gets bad, right? <laughs> yeah, like when, when Verizon calls you with a BGP case, it's probably not that they misconfigured a route map, right? Like, mm. it's probably going to be a bug. And you have a you have a lot behind you, right? You have engineering. You know, you have this massive. You're just the tip of the spear, uh, and there's all all this yeah. all these resources. So it's not like you're that. You have to be that smart. I mean, you got to be smart. You got to know your stuff. But at the end of the day, you've got to use the resources. And there can we are talk lot. about bugs? Actually, let's not. That's a whole separate <laughs> podcast. We gotta yeah, get to we gotta get to TME. Like I know, Andy. I know. I'm it's always too a long. bug. Uh, nah, that's good. <laughs> Uh, I did work at a partner for a while after I did two years in tech and I was burned out. So I went to work at a partner and that didn't go so well. But when I was at that partner, I got my CCI security three attempts just to make it feel good. Andy. Oh, oh good. Three Thank God. Okay. <laughs> um, and that was back in the days of PICS and VPN 3000 series concentrators and all that. Mm. Um, I don't know. There's not much to say about the partner. Part the partner world can be a great place to work, um, but not that part. A partner was kind of. You say partners like a var, like var. somebody who was reselling. So yeah, var. yeah, right. Yeah, okay. a gold partner, basically Cisco gold partner. Gotcha. Um, but I got my security CCA there, and so then I was looking for a way out of there, and I ended up at Juniper Networks, which you've heard of, Andy. I'm sure you have too, Lexi. <laughs> so, some of us, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but he really knows Juniper. And yeah, I, I ended up getting a job as the network architect for corporate IT at Juniper. So I was, so Juniper's, you know, you think about it, Juniper has an IT department, just like any company that they have a network that runs their company. And I was the network architect for that for about six years. Huh. So you're running the corporate wow. network, huh? Yeah. Cool. Wow. So did you, during that time, learn a lot from the people around you with products? And I don't know, I assume corporate IT there uses their own products, right? So You would think. Uh, and they do now. But oh. back in, the, in those days, they were actually, they used, for example, a lot of HP switches. Because EX was a, still a new platform, they didn't make switches. And, you know, so they bought a bunch of HP. And it's not like even when you start making switches, you can just all of a sudden, you know, change out all of your HP. So one of the things we did when I was there was to kick off a Juniper on Juniper project to get us, like, running our own stuff. And by the time I left, and I'm sure now, you know, they use their own stuff, which which they should. <laughs> you know, even though I work at uh, Cisco, they should sense. use their own stuff, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I probably don't know the history as well as I should, but I think they made their... You know, they cut their teeth on like service provider, right? So they probably exactly. didn't have, you know, enterprise class, you know, corporate switches. Oh, they were, okay. They were looking they to run a service provider network. It's it's diversified since then, right? But yeah, back then they might have not had the, I, I mean, I guess they didn't have the gear, right? That's why they're running HP. Yeah, I was 09. I was there 09 to 15, I think. And, um, you know, yeah, they'd made the EX for a while. They just weren't, we weren't deploying it internally. But, um, you know, it, it to your question, Lexi, I think you were asking, um, you know, I learned a lot from people there because I, I was a Cisco guy. I'd never touched Juniper, you know, and, and it was a weird, right. believe me, the, the story was, was it, <laughs> it was a very difficult time because the guy who hired me left before I started. And uh. I ended up reporting to an application guy who knew nothing about networking and didn't really like mm. it, even though he worked at Juniper. And I came in, I, the guy who hired me and was going to mentor me was gone. And I didn't know anything about Juniper. So oh, man. here oh, I boy. am. How am <laughs> I going to be the authority, the network architect telling these guys who've worked there for like 10 years each, this is what you're going to do. Yeah. How are you going to build your network? So it was a disaster for a couple of years. In fact, I quit at one point and they talked me into staying. <laughs> it's like tack all wow. over again. You're writing on a napkin, the, the damn network. And <laughs> yeah. You know, That's crawling actually, through LLDP, trying to figure out what's connected to what. Dear God, it probably our, wasn't documented our, well, I'm guessing. <laughs> Not one well. of our Patreons in the chat asked if people at Juniper treated the network team differently than at other, you know, other places when something wasn't working. Yeah, Did they probably treat worse. You? <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> There's nothing worse than being a network right. guy at a network company where everybody thinks they know right, better, right? right? <laughs> um, <laughs> IT so IT actually when I got there was not well liked and partly I mean they had built for example the, the network was designed with a single point of failure I mean we had one building which was the core of all of Juniper's network and it would go down all the time 
Um, so there's hostility. And I think we built credibility back with, with, hmm. with the business over the years I was there. But it started out kind of bad. And yes, you have... It, it, we had some good partnerships with the business units. And, and there was a marketing aspect, by the way. There's kind of a TME aspect to being the network architect at a networking company because customers want to talk to you. How do you build your network? How do you use your own products? How should we do it? Oh, That's what got me that. interested in technical marketing. Right. Huh. So even as the corp IT guy, the corp network guy, you were kind of getting exposed to customers. Doing presentations, you know, doing uh-huh. EBCs, executive briefing center where we talk to customers. Yeah. Huh. I would have and never like thought of. of so, yeah, I, w- I would have never thought of um, an architect role as just like the enterprise IT person as customer mm. facing then. But is that what you're saying it turned out to be? Yeah, I mean, you know, there was a lot of internal facing work. But, you know, again, like the, the, the customers, we, we were selling Juniper Enterprise Networks when I was there. It was very different because from now because they've acquired Mist and they have a very different story than they had back then. But um, you know we were selling Juniper Enterprise Networks and so our customers say, okay, let's talk to your IT guys. We want to know how they do it. Um, how do you Makes design sense. your network? So we rearchitected. For example, our WAN was all IPsec VPN over the internet back then. Really slow. We we put in an MPLS, our own private MPLS network. Um, we ran it over VPLS, which is basically just layer two. So so the VPLS basically was, think of it like a big switch. And then we just ran our own MPLS on top of that. Um, So, you know, then we'd go tell customers, hey, this is how we did it. You know, we use VRFs to segment off different parts of the company. And, you know, we run our own MPLS. And um, yeah, so they want to know that stuff. So I'm looking at your LinkedIn. This is your pivot to TME, it looks like. Yes. You left Juniper for a TME spot. How... I mean, I know how I found out about the TM or TME role. How did you go from network architect at Juniper to TME guy at Cisco? You know, I'd wanted to do it for a while. And like I said, I was doing some technical marketing kind of work at, um, at Juniper. I actually, my blog initially, now it's a lot more opinion pieces and stories and stuff because I don't do as much hands-on. But a couple of my, the most popular articles on my blog were like explaining Juniper's inet.3 routing table and and some you know internal stuff or, or like how rib groups work and Junos. And I love doing that stuff. I loved writing up technical you know content in a really clear way where people would write me and say, I never understood this before until I read your article. That that mm. to me is a thrill. And I had seen T I'd been to Cisco Live in the past when I worked with the Gold Partner and I'd seen TMEs present breakouts and I always wanted to do that. I thought that looks like a cool job. <laughs> I was terrified of public speaking, but that was another issue I had to get over. Um, but I like the teaching part of it. And so, uh, you know, it just happened to be one day on LinkedIn, a recruiter pinged me and said, you know, I've got this job. It's a principal technical marketing engineer at, at Cisco. And, you know, she's like, I don't think your experience really aligns, but I just thought I'd shot in the dark, you know. And I'm like, no, let me tell you how it aligns. And... <laughs> You know, I interviewed for it with my boss, who's who uh, Carl Solder, spiritual leader of, of technical marketing engineers at Cisco. He's an awesome guy. And we hit it off. He had a similar philosophy about explain how to explain things to people. And he's one of the most gifted presenters I've ever seen. And, and we just hit it off. And and, uh, you know, I got hired in and it was certainly you know, there were, there were rough times at, at Cisco now because I'd been at Juniper six years. I hadn't touched, I was actually first hired on to work on Nexus and I had, they, they had come about after I left the Cisco world and went to Juniper. So now I'm working on Nexus, which I hadn't even touched. And again, I'm a principal, I've got a big title, I'm director level, which I was at Juniper and I'm expected to be authority on something I know nothing about. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the story so of my how'd life. How'd you tackle that one? <laughs> yep. Story of my life. <laughs> you know, you, you've, I think, I don't know if you have Andy, Alexi, I know you've been a Tech Field Day delegate, right? Yeah. Uh, in fact, you heard one of my people, Krishnan, uh, on Tech Field uh, Day. Yeah. Uh, but you might, I was, I was, I think about three weeks into the job and they said, we want you to present at Tech Field Day on puppet, All right. running puppet containers on Nexus switches. And I'm like, oh my God. I didn't know anything about Puppet and I didn't know anything about Nexus. <laughs> and I've got like a couple weeks to get ready for it. Well, Tech Field Day is probably the most stressful presentation that we do. Oh, is TMEs. I can't imagine. Yeah. 
And I'm like, okay. So I got to, I had to call engineering. Like, how does this work? Send me everything you have. Get so, it in the lab. So quick, quick pause here. So did yeah. they know that you didn't know Puppet and you didn't know Nexus? Yeah, they did. But, um, yeah. You know, I was a principal, and I just kind of expect you, nobody else kind of nobody else wanted to do that presentation, so right. well, they're like, "We'll put it on the new guy." What what, what so, I've seen, maybe I'm maybe I'm you know, what, what what I'm trying to say is what I've seen is like so a guy like you, right? Like you're smart, you've learned a lot of different technology stacks, you've got CCIEs. Like, yeah. once you've seen that someone can learn things, you know, they probably knew like, oh, well, this guy, he can learn technical stuff. Make yes. them go learn Puppet and Nexus, right? And and, and, and yeah. that's that's happened to me a couple of times in my career. I get thrown into a role. I don't really seem qualified on paper to do it, but I guess between the, the like you know the person you are, right? You're you're a likable person. You can present. You're well spoken. You're smart, and you can probably learn this other stuff because you learned all yep. this other. But man, what a, what a position to be in! Like NFD coming up, and I got to learn two new technologies in three weeks. Dear <laughs> God, that does not sound fun. It actually, I mean, you can still cool, see the right? video, but, and it went pretty well, actually. Yeah, I was, I was, you pulled yeah, it off, huh? All your peers are watching the live stream, you know, my boss is uh, in the room, I'm just sitting there like, man, I hope I don't break down. Oh. But, <laughs> I hope I don't cry. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's, it's the, but you know, like, same thing with tech. I mean, you just get thrown into stuff, in, in yeah. particularly in, in the big tech companies like Cisco. Um, but even, you know, every job I've had, I mean, like you're saying earlier, Lexi, you know, you're, you're, you're suddenly working with an oscilloscope one day. You don't know even how to use one, but you know, you figure it out and you find the people who know and they help you. Yep. Uh, you rope them into it. As long and as you know. leadership who builds. <laughs> right. And, and I think good leadership builds teams, right? That, yeah. that Lex, we started right full circle. Like why would there be all these varied and sundry skill sets in this technical arena? But yeah. if you have enough of that, people will cross pollinate maybe. Yeah. Right. A healthy, kind of smart. Yeah. yeah. Healthy knowledge base amongst Instead everyone. Instead of everybody knowing the same one mm-hmm. thing, it might not be as, uh, Wow. So you, you, you pulled that off. You fell in love with the TME role. And yeah. have you done a bunch of like NFTs? Is that your favorite thing to do? Like everybody seems to love the NFT experience. I've done. It's not my favorite necessarily. I've done maybe <laughs> three of them. Tom, close your ears. Earmuffs. No, no. I, no they do a great <laughs> job of running it. Yeah, it's yeah, stressful. Yeah. Oh, though. It's, it, it's stressful because if you fail on that one, you fail big, you know, yeah. like it's going to go on YouTube for posterity. And, and, uh, and, and you yeah. know, even Cisco Live is less stressful to me. It's more it's more fun. Um, but but no, they and do demos a great job. can go sideways, right? Like yeah. demos aren't 100 percent. Yeah, you, I did live demos demo. for both of my tech field days. I think I did, too. And I did live demos. Um, so the great mm-hmm. thing now as a leader of a big team is I can just go, you're going to do <laughs> tech field day christian and you know good luck but you know we help people and and when it go, it, it's a great service i think to the to the industry um it's it's a it's really a good thing but but it's stressful you know it's stressful uh, so now you are senior director of technical marketing i'm senior you went yes. from tme to senior director yeah. Of all the TMEs, is that how it works? Yeah. No, 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 no. There, there are a lot of other directors and people. I've got okay. forty. So, so my charter is Cisco's enterprise software defined products. So that's DNA Center, it's um, Identity Services Engine, Software Defined Access, our Campus Fabric. Um, it's all that stuff. How, how do you climb? I know we're going long here, but how, how do you climb the corporate ladder? Like. Were you a manager before director? Like, is it, are you just awesome and people just promote you? Or is it a, (laughs) is it, is it an intentional thing? Like, you know what? I want to be director and these are the 10 things I got to do to get there. I came into Cisco and I I told my wife, I have no intention of, of ever being a manager of people. I don't want to do it. I love being a technical person. That's what I want. And one day my boss came to me and said, I want you to manage a team of three people. And I'm like, okay, because at that point I'm being a leader. I'm in a principal role, but I, I'm, I can't tell anybody what to do. And I, and I have ideas. So I said, okay. So a few months later, he comes back to me and he says, I've got your team. There's 12 people on it. And, I'm like, okay. <laughs> and I took over that team and we did software to find access. We did programmability, which was what I had made a name in, even though I, again, I knew nothing about programmability before I came to Cisco. 
and um, and then it just kept growing. Why did you say okay to a management role you didn't want? Because your boss asked you to? Partly, but also, like yeah. I said, I mean, I, I was just feeling at Juniper and at Cisco, I was doing these roles where I was a leader, an authority, but I had no power, right? Like I had, I had mm. to influence without authority. Right. And I thought if I have a team, I'll have more ability to, to, to mold things the way I want, right? Whereas when you're an individual yeah. contributor, you don't have that. Um, and, you know, he told me, oh, you'll still get to do all the individual contributor stuff like present at Cisco Live and all that. But um, it ended up, you know, the more the more you get into it, the more of a manager you become and the less of a technical person. But I still try to stay technical, you know. Right. Do you, do you feel like that authority has helped you kind of. Has that given you some. I don't know, how do you say this? Have you been able to achieve things, you know, with that power that, that you couldn't have <laughs> otherwise? Some things. You yeah. know, you learn it, it's still hard. It, it's still hard. You know, I mean, I can tell the people who work for me to do something and they'll, they'll do it because they, they report into me ultimately. Yeah. But I can't necessarily make engineering do something. I can't make product managers do something. Right. Um, so I'm still influencing people without authority. And a big company like Cisco, it's hard. It's really hard to get stuff done. You have to negotiate with a lot of different parties. They yeah. have other priorities. So, you know... It's I, I don't I have no regrets. I love, you know, the reason the other reason I got into it, Andy, too, was I, I love to mentor people and I love the job. I enjoyed being a TME. I like going out and talking to people and presenting and doing all that. And I wanted to help people be better TMEs, you know. Right. And I'm asking awesome. for a selfish reason. You know, I, I want to rule the world someday, but I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know if I have the patience for managing people. Because people yeah. can generally be, I mean, I guess it depends on the people you're surrounded by, but historically I've been surrounded by people that I wouldn't want to be <laughs> responsible for. Not so much well, now where I am, but. You and know, then in you've my, got the my, HR aspect of managing, which I've, I've met a lot of engineers yeah. now who love managing people and helping, you know, mentor in that way. Uh, yeah. But then they get to the HR part of it and they're just like, ugh, I, you know. They don't I want mean, to do it. Yeah, that's a good point. I've, I've had to lay people off. I've had to fire people. Mm. I've had to deal with employee relations cases um, where Man. people are fighting with each other. I mean, I don't like any of that. I don't I don't like yeah. to lay someone off. And thankfully, we're not doing layoffs at Cisco like we used to. And hopefully we won't for a long time. But for a while, they were like pretty regular. Um, and that's not for everybody. And you, you, I don't care how technical you think you are, you become less and less technical the more you get into people management. And if that's your passion, being technical, you know, then maybe it's not the right thing. So, so what, are the, what are the qualities of a great TME? You're, you know, you have 40 people under you, you're, you're yeah. hiring for a TME. I, I, when, when I was looking for something different, because I was working all the maintenance windows and all the nights and all the oh, weekends yeah. and all the things. And I was just burnt out. Um, I reached out to a guy in the community, Wes Kennedy, and he was a TME. And, you know, he, he was like everybody in this community. Like, I'm, I'm, I can't believe the networking, networking community, especially on Twitter. Um, I reached out to him. He got on the phone with me. We talked for 45 minutes. Like, just he was so selfless. But at the end of the conversation, he's like, you'd be great. You have what you need. Don't worry about it. Because... Previous to talking to him, I had like six interviews in a week at this other vendor and they said, you know, I wasn't technical enough. I didn't have enough product knowledge of. Huh. So I was I was on that. That's why I'm asking is a, a network engineer who maybe likes to present or is good with people or maybe has a passion for teaching. Is, is that the secret sauce? Maybe. Or is it something better or different than that? No, I think that's that is the secret sauce, and it's that okay. balance of finding the technical with the with the T with the M, as we say. You know, the T, the technical, and the M, the marketing. I mean, you, mm. you need both. And <clears throat> if you're not very technical, but you're you know good at marketing and talking, and you know that, that's not going to work. If if you're right. if you're very technical, but again, you're the one who wants to be in a dark room and not in front of people. I mean, we have to stand up. One of my guys at Cisco Live next week is going to stand up in front of a room of 900 people. It's more than even. I've done 500. I've never done 900. Oof. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, you have to be ready. Not everybody wants to do that. Um, right. But if you if you have that capability, and, and by the way, you know, if you're bad at it, the people at Cisco Live will let you know it when you get your <laughs> scores back. So, you, you know, uh. you if you're if you don't make an effort to be good at that kind of stuff then the communications part of it then you're going to fail 
at the job. Right. So it's a combination of both. It's hard to find. It's really hard to find. And I always tell people, focus on the technical, get your certs, you know, get experience, but but work on making sure you can communicate well, you know, start a blog, do something that, that helps get you writing, speaking, whatever you can do to um, to develop that side of things and you'll be a good TME. How do you know if you're technical enough? Like, are you looking yeah. at certs? Are you, I mean, you're obviously doing technical interviews, I guess, and peppering them with, you know, I mean, I've done enough technical interviews to know they're awful um, and you never know yeah. what they're going to ask you. Well, if we, if we had another show, I could go on about my <laughs> thoughts on technical interviewing because I, I don't think we do it well. And I, I used to do uh, the thing where we grilled people when I was in TAC and, and I think there are better ways to do it than making people We miserable. should have an episode on that, technical interviews. That, that would be a really fascinating one. I think I fell on my face. What's oh, that? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I, I, I fell on my face on both of my technical interviews on my two big networking jobs, but in hindsight and from the feedback yeah. I got from them, they wanted to see a couple of different things, like how I could, if, if can I work a problem? What's my thought process of going through a problem and how I was under pressure. <laughs> this, yeah. this one place put me in a thing I, I could have never done, but I didn't run out of the room. I kept asking questions and, you know, and I, and I wasn't an a-hole as they put it. We want a guy who was, you know, we want a guy who's going to fit into the culture who isn't a jerk and That's somebody important. we can, yeah. And then somebody like we can teach you the rest. You, you know, you, you have a couple certs, you have a little bit of experience. We can teach you the rest. But those tech, it's it's always been challenging for me. I know this isn't about me, but like TME sounds really cool. I just don't know if I'm technical enough. I love labbing. I love the tech, but there's so much I don't know. And when I talk to TMEs, I'm like, wow, the, the, the depth of their knowledge I've never had. I can make a network yeah. work. But I'm not talking about ASICs and TK, you know, whatever crazy minutia they get into for the job. But they're usually sometimes. focused too on one technology, you, you know, mm-hmm. and, and that's the thing about it. They often have depth, but not not as much breadth. Um, uh-huh. You know, I mean, the really good ones have a lot of breadth, and they've done multiple things in their careers. But you know, if I if I put you on SD WAN, you know, then you're going to know a lot about SD WAN. You may not know a thing about data center. Um, and that, that's typical of, of anyone, you know, you talk to TAC people who are, who are often really deep, you know, but, the, but I think one of your guests talked about that, like she was working on UCS and she knew UCS, but not much about other technologies. So, yeah. I mean, the, the, the hiring, it depends, you know, like we hired a guy to work on ICE recently on any services engine and security product. And, you know, we wanted someone who knew ICE, <laughs> like ICE takes a long time to learn. So we hired someone who yeah. knew ICE, who had worked with it. Who had a lot of experience. Sometimes that's what we're looking for. Sometimes, like you said, I just want to know, have you demonstrated a technical ability? Have you learned, you know, and succeeded in technical positions? And then I know I can teach you the rest. You know, we'll throw you in the mm-hmm. lab, you know, in a couple of weeks time, you know, a couple couple customer calls. That's what we do, right? We're always just thrown in the deep end. <laughs> I've been back in Actually, the lab for weeks. It's wonderful and awful all at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> we have a we have a kind of funny question from a Patreon. Um, given that you get access to technology early in the life of the product, I guess this would be you know your engineer days. But uh, is yeah. there any tech you wish you could sabotage so it wouldn't get out as you were trying to make it work in the lab? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that that one. Uh, the, the answer to that is yes, but I'm not going to go any further. <laughs> no That's comment fair. beyond there. Yeah. I, I do value my 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 job. I, I mean, no, some of it's frustrating. And look, you know, when you when you get the early code, I mean, it, it, you, you practically want to sabotage all of it because I mean, you, you just you waste so much time. Things don't work, and that's normal, right? I mean, nothing works the first time. Yeah. That's why we're testing it in the lab. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, look, I, I don't make all the decisions and there are things in the products in my portfolio that maybe I would have done differently, but you know, uh, it's a, it's a team effort. <laughs> I, I don't want to end before we circle back to something you said in the beginning, okay. which was, you know, you liked what we're doing here, which thank you. really appreciate, but you know, we need more industry evangelizing. And I guess I just wanted to dig in a little bit, you know, into that, like why, why, why do you think that? Because I get, you know, every time I turn around, there's some podcast or YouTube channel or influencer, you know, right, talking about or evangelizing things. What, why do you think we need more evangelizing in the industry? 
Yeah, I, 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 maybe I'll step in a little controversy here, but I, I think there's a message that's been going out lately, which is that, you know, like we were talking about earlier, you shouldn't learn to be a network engineer. Learn Python. It's all about yeah. software now. Learn software. Learn yeah. APIs. Learn those things. Like there's all this stuff. Learn to code. Learn to code. You know, we're trying to get more women to code, which is great, but it's all code, right? Coding. Right. Well, you know, why? Because network engineers, all these, all SDN and APIs and all that, it's going to take your career, your career is not going to exist in a few years, right? And I talk about that in my session at Cisco Live, uh, uh, but, you know, it, it's, it's not actually true. I don't care what kind of automation systems you use. I don't care how good you are programming. Like I said earlier, you need to know what it is that you're managing. You need to know how this stuff works. You need to get out your oscilloscope and <laughs> see the <laughs> see the the bits yeah. on the wire. Um, yeah, I gotta say um, that that makes sense to me. I I agree with you wholeheartedly, Jeff. I'm actually really happy to hear someone like Good. senior in the industry say that because you know I've I've had experiences in the past with software developers that you know have hired at you know former companies where we hired them to automate the network, but they had no networking experience. And so it was just a big disaster, essentially. Like it's, it, it seems almost easier to teach a network engineer to code what they need to versus teaching a software developer to become a network engineer almost, you know? Lex, are you looking at my notes? Are you hacked into my system and looking at my notes? <laughs> no, but Andy, I know we have very similar thoughts on this. Well, yeah, yeah. Every, every automation tool I've used is a software dev tool, right? With like even the terms, like the, the non-networking terms, like it's it's all, I, I don't know why network people aren't creating automation platforms. And that's part of what I'm trying to do where I'm at, but not create one, but try to make, you know, all the terminology, the philosophy, how things are done. Like it's just so, why does the networking person have to learn programmatic, coding, CSCD pipeline, DevOps, and not the other way around. I mean, I, I think I know the answer to that, but it always just seems, I think it's why I've been crying for three years, Lex, about why automation is so hard for me because. I'm right there I, with you, man. I, so, I, don't, I don't enjoy it. Like I want the networking, I don't want the coding. Yeah. So, so, so I know, yeah. I know you need to wrap up, but can I give you an yeah. analogy real quick? <laughs> Please. Yeah. Just, I mean, this is know, a hot topic here. We, we're good. TMEs talk for a living. So shut me up when you're, when you're, <laughs> so I, I give the analogy in my session. I've used it many, many times about airplanes. If you look at an airplane cockpit from like the seventies, right? It's all levers and, you know, dials and switches. Right. And you look at it now and it's a beautiful glass cockpit, right? Screens, mm -hmm. very few manual controls. Um, and and the, the pilots who fly the, the plane, they still need to know about aerodynamics, weather systems, navigation, all of that, right? But they're just interacting with the machine in a more efficient way, right? The way they're, they're putting information in and getting it back is, is more efficient. Um, and at the end of the day, we need to automate. We, we do need to automate, you know, as we manage larger and larger networks, um, you know, as more and more devices show up on the networks, wireless, you know, IOT, all this stuff does explode the number, the amount of stuff we have on the networks and therefore the number of devices we're managing. We need the tools, we need the automation, we need the assurance, we need to learn how to script, we need to do some of that stuff. But we don't need to be coders, we don't need to be experts. You know, like if you look at the code, I used to do programmability for years, that was my thing. I never thought it would be. I came into Cisco, it became my thing. I was doing Python scripting. And you look at the code I wrote and it was pretty bad, but it worked because I'm a network engineer. I don't need to optimize it. I don't need it to be beautiful. I need it to work. So that's the point. I mean, at the end of the day, we're still network engineers. There are going to be some different tools that we use to do our jobs, but we still have to do our job. And it's the same job as it was before. And we need to know it just like that pilot needs to know all that stuff. So learn the core, especially if you're new to the industry, learn the fundamentals, learn the core. And when people are hiring software engineers to do a network engineer's job, they're going to call you someday and say, yeah, yeah maybe, maybe come over. We here. messed up. Can you yeah. come back? <laughs> yeah, That's a great Thanks note to end that. on. I love that. Is there yeah. anything we should have asked you that we didn't? Oh, no, I think we covered the gamut. You know, like I said, I, I, I can go on for a while, but th this was fun. Thank you for having me. We'll uh, have you I, back for more more opinionated talks on specific <laughs> things because you've, got, you've got some great opinions. Yeah. Anytime. <laughs> yeah. It's been fun. Thanks so much and for coming on, Jeff. We'll, we'll Go ahead, Lex. 
No, I was just going to say, Jeff, where can we find you in general? We've talked about your blog. Um, You're welcome to shout that out again. Where else? Subnetzero.info. I I, I actually started a Substack to subnetzero.substack.com. I have, I think, six subscribers, so it's going well. Yeah, I'm I'm hoping to get to seven or eight. And um, (laughs) I haven't published anything in a while because we're getting ready for Cisco Live. I've just been tied up. But uh, other than that, uh, I don't have Twitter. I'm kind of, you know not a social media guy but uh yeah you can put comments on my blog I'll, i will respond to them eventually awesome okay awesome thank Great. you so much jeff this has been yeah, fantastic um if anybody out there is looking for a study group we have about 2700 people at this point in our discord study group art of netengs.com i a a t j stands for it's all about the journey uh, you can check out our swag uh, over at the merch store, artofnetengine.com forward slash store. We're always on Twitter at Art of Net Eng. And uh, if you'd like to support us through our Patreon program, uh, you could actually come in here and watch us record these things uh, in person and ask our guests and us questions. Uh, that's at patreon.com, Art of Net Eng. Uh, Jeff, thanks so much. Lex, always great to see you. And we will catch you next time on the Art of Network Engineering. Hey, y'all. This is Lexi. If you vibe with what you heard us talking about today, we'd love for you to subscribe to our podcast in your favorite podcatcher. Also, go ahead and hit that bell icon to make sure you're notified of all our future episodes right when they come out. If you want to hear what we're talking about when we're not on the podcast, you can totally follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Art of NetEng. That's Art of N-E-T-E-N-G. You can also find a bunch more info about us and the podcast at artofnetworkengineering.com. Thanks for listening.